So how do we create growth in society without understanding what people think and feel? Um, at Gallup, we've been studying what people think and feel for decades, but more recently, we've really gotten into that in more depth by, starting in 2005, asking about 100 questions around the world, random samples around the world representing 98% of the world's population. That gives us scientists a way to think about and really categorize what matters in people's lives, what differentiates someone who's thriving from someone who's struggling or suffering, and are there some generalizable elements that we can do something about. Now, I was in uh, Canadian Customs, going through Canadian Customs, uh, recently with a, with a colleague of mine uh, earlier this year. And uh, the customs agent, agent stopped us and was kind of interrogating us a little bit and asking us a lot of questions. One of them was, what are you doing in our country? Um, our answer was, we're doing some well-being research. He gave us a really puzzled look. And, um, and he asked the question, what is well-being? And my colleague, who has more sales talent than I do, turned to me and said, it's happiness. And I kind of turned to him, with a puzzled look, and I said, well, it's actually a lot more than happiness. It includes really everything in our life. And I started going through all the research details of that, and then I thought to myself, we need to get out of customs. Yeah, he's right, it's happiness. But uh, it's actually a lot more than happiness, and I'm going to talk to you about that in the next uh, several minutes here. This polling we do around the world does give us some insights into what matters, and uh, are there generalizable elements or not? Or is everybody so different in every society that we have to kind of reinvent what matters in people's lives regardless of where we, we go? Well, we look not only at this current large database of public opinion, um, all the way from opinions about leadership to opinions about personal lives and what people are experiencing. Uh, we also look back into history. And, uh, but as we're looking back into history, and one of the very first questions that we asked people was a top of mind question. It goes like this. All of us want certain things out of life. If you imagine your future in the best possible way, what would your life look like to be happy? You can all answer that question. The answers we got, the top two, were almost invariable across different parts of the world. Kind of surprised me a little bit. What do you think they are? Health. Health. And wealth. Now, more recently, what's the third one that pops in? Job. Job. Um, really important. Those are the top of mind. Now, we could have stopped the research right there and said, that's the answer. That's what matters in people's lives. Let's stop the research and let's, let's move on. But, of course, we had to dig a little deeper. We had to study the data, look at what actually does predict future thriving states. Uh, what are the elements? Because not, not everything that's top of mind for us, um, we're not always aware of what matters, I guess I should say. We have to kind of dig a little deeper to understand, make people aware of, of what matters the most and build some measurement around that. And one of the studies we came across in this kind of historical review before we started collecting our own data was a study done by our founder, Dr. Gallup, in the late 50s, published in the early 60s, is a study called The Secrets of a Long Life, where he studied people who lived to be 95 years of age and older. Um, and his goal was to understand what they had in common. Some timeless findings just in that one study. Uh, and uh, one of them was these people liked their jobs. They worked into their 80s, many of them. They lived to be 95 and older. Um, they, found, they got a great deal of satisfaction out of their job. They had a lot of happiness with their work, the, the quality of work they did. Uh, from a physical standpoint, they did eat smaller meals. We know that today, today that that's, that's important. Uh, they had jobs that required them to move around a lot. Nowadays, we call this exercise. Um, back then, they just moved around a lot, and they, they, they kept moving, and, and that, that led to longer lives. So there, there were some, uh, they had good family lives as well, but there were some kind of timeless findings just in that one study. Now, doc, one of Dr. Ca Gallup's colleagues, Hadley Cantrell, asked a question that we're still asking today on all of our Holes, and it sort of goes like this. Uh, imagine a ladder with steps from zero at the bottom to, to 10 at the top. Uh, the top is the best possible life. The bottom is the worst possible life. Where are you at on that ladder of life, zero to 10? You can all answer that for yourselves right now. And there's a follow-up question. Where do you think you'll be in the next five years? Now, people who give a seven to the first question and, or above and an eight or above to the second question are in a state that we call thriving. And if you answered seven or above and eight or above, then you're consistent with about 24% of the world's population. About 24%. Isn't it kind of cool? We've got a number now on the thriving state of the entire world, representative samples of the world. It allows us to do a lot of pretty cool things. But um, now if you drill down a bit and you look all over the world, Denmark is the highest at 74%. The range uh, all the way to 4% in, in central 
uh, African Republic, 2% in Cambodia. And if we uh, flip it around and look at the U.S., 53%. So we've got some room to grow just in the U.S. I looked at the numbers today, it's actually 52% today. When I put this together, it's 53. If you dig down even deeper into Nebraska, 56%. And here in good old Omaha, we're at 59% thriving. So there's a lot of opportunity. I guess my point, there's a lot of range. But despite all that range around the world, we did find there's some common elements that predict whether people are thriving or not, regardless of where they are. And here's the five. They range from basic, I'd call them foundational issues, like your career. Now, when I say career, I'm not talking about people just with a 9-to-5 job. Uh, people who are retired have a career. People who are students have a career. Um, and what I mean by that is, is when, you ask, when you meet somebody for the first time and you ask them, the first question you ask them is probably what? What do you do? Your answer to that question is your career. Um, so career well-being is about liking what you do on a daily basis. Social well-being is about having solid relationships, a lot of love in your life. Uh, financial well-being isn't just about, just about amount of money. Um, it's, it's about how you use your money to affect security and, and, and daily stress, reduction of daily stress. Physical well-being isn't just about disease burden. It's also about how you manage uh, your current genetic situation so that you can have a lot of energy throughout the day. And community well-being, the most overlooked of the five, kind of a differentiator between a good life and a great life, is whether you like where you live and are you involved in where you live and making a difference. Now these blips right here you see, these represent uh, daily mood, the mood of Americans. We track this with Healthways and you can see a lot of ups and downs here, but that top line, that blue line, these are the percentage of people with a lot of happiness and enjoyment without a lot of stress and worry. So that's the percentage of people each day that are having a really good day. And the bottom is the percentage of people with a lot of stress and worry without a lot of happiness and enjoyment, so they're having a really bad day. And you can see there's a lot of range, a lot of ups and downs, from a high of uh, approaching 70% to a low, this is in 2012, um, below 40%. A pretty big jump. Think about mood shifting in the U.S. that much, depending on the day. Now, what are the causes of these ups and downs? Well, there's a couple of kind of surface level ones. One is weekends and holidays are the peaks. And uh, the valleys start on Mondays. Anybody ever hear of the Blue Monday effect? Well, it turns out in the research that Mondays are kind of discriminated against because Tuesdays are just as bad. And uh, Wednesdays are just as bad as Tuesdays, and Thursdays are just as bad as Wednesdays, and Fridays are a little bit better. Um, unless, Monday, if, unless Mondays are a holiday, of course, then, then they're just like, the, uh, just like the Sundays and Saturdays. But if you dig deeper, so you could stop right there and say, well, we should just give people a lot more holidays and a lot more weekends, and, and we'll solve a lot of well-being issues, right? Well, if you dig deeper, you find out there's some things beneath this pattern of weekends and holidays. What happens more on weekends and holidays? We have a little bit more social time, that's right. We have more social time on those days, and that's a big differentiator in whether people have a good day or not. There's another thing that happens, that, that drop-off from Sunday to Monday, if you're in a good workplace where you're in the right job that fits your talents and, um, and if you have a good manager, that drop-off uh, is significantly less, about half as much from Sunday to Monday. So there's, there's some things that we can do related to our career and our social lives that influence whether we have good days or not. It's not just about weekends and holidays, it's about the things that happen then and how we can make those kinds of things happen in the workplace. Great workplaces um, are excellent social centers while they're getting a lot done, um, in addition to, um, to being uh, workplaces where people are in the right jobs and, and have great managers. And so um, that's what the mood looks like in America. And if I, I want to be really prescriptive, I'd say, if you want to tackle those two things, I'd say get a job where you can do what you do best and get a great manager if you're in a full-time job. If you're not, get a job that interests you and fits your talents. Um, and get six hours or more of social time on a daily basis. Now, that's kind of hard for me. I need some help to get that done. I've got a social planner at home that helps me a lot, um, that forces me into social situations, and I don't want to be there, but when I'm there and, I, and I'm done, I actually had a good time. So we all, we all need partners in that respect. Financial well-being. Um, here's the, here's the, the question, the age-old question. Does money buy happiness? 
It's not, probably not the best question because the answer really is that money doesn't guarantee, everybody's heard money doesn't buy happiness. Money doesn't guarantee happiness, but there's some things you can do with money despite your income that influence whether people have uh, high well-being or not. One is do you use your money to affect basic needs. Another is do you use your money to basically buy yourself some security, a sense of security. Does money uh, relate to a lack of daily worry? Is it managed in such a way that you have, you have less worry during the day? Do you buy experiences as opposed to things? Um, experiences predict uh, whether we uh, relive those experiences over time. Sometimes you get embellished a little bit, but that's okay. Um, those experiences are what live beyond the tangible things. And giving. People that use their money to give have higher well-being themselves. These are all scientific, scientifically uh, studied um, outcomes. So career, social, financial. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is that when you get those first two right, career and social, uh, people interpret their money differently. They interpret their standard of living differently. So those two are pretty foundational as well. Physical well-being, um, you've seen in the press and different articles that have, that have been put together, that two-thirds of our health care costs are due to discretionary kinds of things, just lifestyle choices like what we eat and, uh, and our exercise habits. The, the one that's kind of overlooked is sleep. Now, we study strengths a lot at Gallup, but we've also studied grouchy people. And uh, when we study grouchy people and we see that they get a good night's sleep, their mood actually bumps up to above average levels. So there's something to that about a uh, good night's sleep. Now, uh, sleep relates to mood, of course, but in addition to mood, um, it also relates to, to health. And, and, but within the same range, so about that seven to nine hour range, you see the same kinds of effects with regard to physical outcomes and also mood outcomes. Too much is bad, too little is bad as well. So managing within that range, of course, uh, understanding that it's very individual. When we study 30-year-olds with low well-being who are struggling or suffering, their health care costs are actually higher than a 60-year-old with high well-being who's thriving. Kind of interesting. There's a lot of, it's not just about age, there's a lot within, within age that we can uh, impact. Community well-being is the difference between a good life and a great life. At a basic level, it's living in a safe place. At the highest level, it's about being involved in your community in a way that's unique to you as an individual. So are you involved related to a purpose that's unique, even if it's a selfish purpose? If it's a purpose that is important to you and it helps your community, uh, then it's better for you and it's better for your community. So there's five elements. Um, one of the things we found as we looked across these elements is that there are some things getting in the way. Um, now, while two-thirds of people are thriving in... Um, in at least one of these five elements, of the people we've studied, only 9% are thriving in all five. So there's something that gets in the way of uh, getting these kinds of things done. One of them, and I'm not here bashing immediate gratification because some of the best things in life are immediate gratification things, but um, it gets in the way, but it can be flipped on its side also. So we all know the things that we shouldn't do that are related to immediate gratification, but we can also build in uh, through organizations and things that we do, short-term incentives that match with our longer-term goals. So let me give you an example. My motivation to exercise isn't that I will reduce my chance of heart disease several years later. It's really that I have a better mood that same day. Same can be said for eating healthy. Same thing can be said for getting a good job. A better motivator, a short-term incentive that aligns with the longer-term goal is a better mood today. And in the end, it relates to higher well-being in the longer term. So we can utilize immediate gratification to our advantage as well. The other thing is a singular focus. Most people that try to get things done, get them done by focusing on one thing, like physical well-being, all at once. They, they go down the path of that, they have a goal, they reach their goal, and then things stop. So the way we found that people who have thriving well-being really impacted is that they look at it in a holistic way. They look at it in a very holistic way. They, they build in action areas that relate to multiple elements, their career, their social, their financial, their physical, their community. They think about well-being holistically as opposed to a singular focus. Now, what do we do about all this? Well, I think one of the best opportunities we have for well-being change in the world is through communities, but it's also through organizations. Why? It's because in organizations, what we have are naturally existing social networks. We have uh, networks that can bring in these multiple elements all at once and bring people together reaching toward the same goals through leadership, through norms that are set in organizations, and also through uh, awareness, just better awareness. 
Here's a question for you. I'll end with this. I have substantially overall, higher overall well-being because of the organization I work for today. We find in our research only 12% of people can strongly agree with that. I think therein lies your opportunity and in terms of setting uh, not only a different kind of awareness, but also um, different kinds of positive defaults in organizations and uh, improving well-being for individuals. Thank you very much for your time.